Yeah, hey, uh, I'm Tim Ruffles. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, callback hell and various ways of avoiding it, what callback hell is and isn't, um, and yeah, it's all the kind of fun things. Uh, I'm working on a thing called Sidekick.js at the moment, which is a code quality tool for JavaScript. So first off, I really think uh, we, was we, not everyone in this room, but kind of Hacker News and the kind of zeitgeist in general has got callback hell wrong. Whenever I see a post about callback hell, often from someone touting a different language, uh, so like Haskellers particularly love giving some horrible example of nested callbacks uh, to say that no, just can't really handle complicated um, workflows without just a complete mess. Um, I'm never really convinced by this. I really don't think uh, we really see like a pyramid of doom particularly often in our code. Um, no, it does happen. Uh, beginner know people do write kind of horrific pyramids of code. If you have a look around GitHub, you will find stuff like this. So this is actually some source code for a platform as a service uh, written on Node, which does have like nested callbacks five levels deep. So it does indeed happen, but there's really no need to. So for me, this is not callback hell. This is like callback confusion. This is when people who don't know how to use Node particularly well or JavaScript particularly well, really, uh, write complicated code. Because there's just no need for pyramids in the simple cases. So quick, quick example, we have some kind of standard action in, in an express app, some kind of web app. It doesn't really matter which. Uh, all we want to do is get a user, then get their profile if the user exists, then update it, and just handle all those cases. Now, this would be the kind of super naive way of writing it. We have three levels of callbacks, which means that we have two areas of our code um, that we just can't test. We can't get to them. They're inside the closure. You know, it's kind of simple to write. It's all on the same, you know, same kind of in line, but it's just a nightmare to test. They're just, we can't get at them. So this is just a, a non-option, really. Regardless of how we do it, we, we have to stub every single async callback uh, in this process to be able to unit test the two handlers, uh, or we just not have to test it, which isn't really acceptable in this kind of day and age. You know, you know, code has to be tested. I don't really consider code I write kind of real code until I have tests. That's because I don't trust myself. Maybe you're less paranoid. Um, so the first thing we need to do is to reveal our callbacks. All our handlers need to be accessible from the outside world because then we can test them really easily. You know, a callback handler isn't really asynchronous. You know, its, it's input has got to it asynchronously, but we can easily test it synchronously. If we ex expose it, we can just get to it via a name or here I've got a kind of object-oriented solution where it's just on the prototype. So we can easily set up everything we need to test this without any kind of mocking or stubbing and it's very, it's very kind of simple. Um, and then the second reason is that very often it's just uh, not using the tools that JavaScript already gives us. So who's used uh, function.bind here? So a good number of people. Uh, function.bind is a really, really useful little tool in JavaScript. Lives on the function prototype. And it lets you specify the context of this, which is less important if you're not doing kind of object-oriented stuff. But really interestingly, it lets you preset arguments. And you get back a kind of new version of the function, which is often called a partially applied function, which just means you've pre-filled some of those arguments, so now it needs less, needs fewer arguments. And you can use this to reduce and flatten down your code. Because in our example, we have two bits of data we need to send forward to the next bit of our code. That's why we were initially using this closure and sharing all the variables inside it. But now we can just, in the first level of the closure, bind the one variable we already need, get back a new callback that needs less data, and we don't have that kind of nesting. So if you have a look at this example over here, we flatten it down a lot by using that function.bind call. Same data is required, same level of kind of in, you know, it, we could have the same level of nesting if we didn't handle it, but we've used the bind, got one fewer levels of nesting, everything's nice and simple. Um, and it, that's it. So bind is a, is a way of having context without closures, gives you your partially applying function. You can also see uh, underscore or low dashes uh, partial functions that don't mess around with the this context, so they're even better for, for functional code. So is this solved callback hell? Is that all there is to callback hell? Well, I really don't think so. I think there's some much more kind of complex and pernicious stuff that's much harder to squash down and deal with with no code because of callbacks, because of some issues with how callbacks affect our code. So what's still a pain? Well, first off, we might see something like a parallel process where we have two things we need to run, and then we need to run a third callback when we've got both results. And as soon as you write this kind of code, you realize there's nothing built into the language to handle it for you. You're going to have to write some ad hoc stuff. So you can see here, I've got a kind of counter, and when I've got both results, I'm going to keep going. If I had three, I'd have kind of three bits of kind of ad hoc code to write. Uh, so 
ad hoc code, solved it, but it's kind of a little bit messy. Every time we do parallel code, we're going to have to have that same boilerplate of ad hoc stuff. The same if we're doing anything with a, a set of stuff we need to do something asynchronously with. So this is, you know, 90% 90, 90 of code is pretty much like going over loops of things, doing things to more than one thing at a time. It's obviously going to crop up all the time. All of the maps, filters, reduce, everything, all, all that kind of stuff has its place in the asynchronous world as well. We need to do exactly the same things. But every time we have to do this with just pure callbacks, we're going to have to do that same ad hoc bookkeeping code. And we can see here that there's just something in the language, something that callbacks do, which is making this ugly code. Um, we're implementing flow control, basically, every single time we do this. You know, we have this two processes happening. If you're doing it in a synchronous language, you just have two lines, and it would block on both lines, and then it will continue after they're both back. But in Node, we're having to do this, this bookkeeping ourselves. So it's ad hoc code. You can see I'm having to write the same thing again and again. And the normal solution to that is to grab a library. Someone must have done this before. It's not like a weird problem that you know, only I've had. And indeed, there is. There's async.js. Who's used async.js? Oh, yeah, a good number of people. Cool. So async.js is great. It's basically a ton of ad hoc code to solve these problems. It's, it's all the code you're otherwise going to have to write yourself, but it's wrapped up in a library. So it can do things like chaining, so you can have a dependent flow of callbacks in one go. It can do things like parallel, so you have n callbacks that need to fire at once, and then a final callback that gives you all of their results, which is fantastic. Does enumeration. We can do maps, filters, reduce, all this kind of good stuff. Um, and it has a very simple syntax. It works very well with Node. You just have to follow the Node callback convention, so we have error, and then we have data, and everything will be happy. Um, it requires all the code to match the interface. If you had a different callback convention, say, in the browser, you could do the same thing. There's nothing kind of specific to know about this stuff. It's just a way of handling a callback convention. You could do the same thing for the browser if you wanted. So someone else has written the code for us. Is that the, is that the problem solved? Well, for me, not really. For me, this is an incredibly leaky abstraction. So I think Joel Spolsky came up with the idea of a leaky abstraction, which is when you create an abstraction, but then you continuously have to work around the underlying problem leaking out still. So you haven't completely contained it. Whatever the problem is with callbacks that requires all this ad hoc code still escapes. And it escapes wherever there isn't a, a function in async that does exactly what you need. So in this example earlier, it's a very simple example, we had uh, the user and then the profile and then we created. Uh, we effectively have both a chain and a waterfall because we need to be able to get all of the results and the sum of the results at the same time. And if you have a look at it, you suddenly realize you can't do both. The uh, arguments, sorry, kind of the parameters of that flow function don't give us all the data we need. So once again, we're going to have to start implementing stuff ourselves. So the abstraction has leaked. We still have the same problem. And every single time you come to an edge case that async doesn't handle, you're going to have that problem again. So we haven't solved it at the root. What is this root problem with callbacks? Well, to me, the problem is that we have no values. So when you call a normal function, it goes and does something, and you get back a value. And from that point on, you can start using that value stored in a variable. You can use it in the code below, which is nice. Obviously, the fundamental thing when you have callbacks is you can't do that. You can't just block on a line and get a value back and start reasoning about it. You have to kind of line up all your code in front of it in a big, long line, kind of Rube Goldberg style, where every, all the callbacks are set up, and then the data flows through at the end. But you can't start reasoning about it uh, because you don't have a value. You don't have a value coming back. If you have a look at an example written in synchronous style, so this is the same exact process, you can see that because we have the values, we can start using ifs and elses, tries and catch. It's all pretty simple because we have values to work with. We don't have to set up a bunch of inline stuff to flow the data through. We don't have to re-implement um, control flow, which is pretty neat. So can we get values with async? Is there a way of doing this? There is. There's promises. Again, so who's used promises so far? Nice. Good number. A less, lot less than async. A promise is a very simple idea at the core, which is it's an IOU. So we're going to get back, instead of a process with a callback, we're going to get back an IOU for the value straight away. So we get back to synchronicity. Uh, we get back this, this value, and then the async process will eventually resolve, and we can look inside that value, and at some point we'll get it out, which is pretty neat. But the really exciting thing is we can start using it ahead of time, as it were. Um, it doesn't matter when you attach. The value is kind of like a little box that you can wire up to other boxes, and the data will flow through at some future point. So we have a look over here. We can start chaining up promises. 
Uh, so over here we have a process get a that returns a promise, and we can return a new promise for a transformed value of that code inside, which is really pretty neat. Uh, so we have a dependent process here, which is like a chain. So just the data is flowing forward. You can see it's extremely simple. We just replace all our kind of callbacks with thens. And then the final value that's returned is a promise for the final transform value. You can go through as many steps as you need. It's all pretty neat. It reads quite nicely. You can have multiple consumers from each promise. Um, it's much more like kind of a spreadsheet where all the data can interrelate. These values are very simple. Multiple dependencies are extremely easy in this. So we have uh, a parallel process going forward. Because we get back a value straight away, we can do the get A, and then we can make B start as soon as A is finished without any kind of um, nesting. There's no call stack depth. There's no kind of anonymous functions popping up. Uh, so you can see we've got A, get A, and then we can immediately make a, com a promise for B by passing the value of get A into a new function that returns the promise for B, and then we can make a value for C, which is done when both A and B are finished. So we've solved that kind of, we need the waterfall going through, and we need the parallel. We've got all the data at once. Really, really nice, really simple. Um, parallel is as simple as just using all. Enumerations are really interesting, because with callbacks, you have to, you absolutely have to, write some extra code before you can start using maps and reducers and filters and all that kind of stuff. With promises, the abstraction is actually much nicer. Because you have this, this uh, ability to transform a promise and return a promise for the transformed value, we can immediately use map with it without a single line of library code. We have a map of, sorry, we have a list of promises for a value of type A. We map over it with a thing that makes a promise for a value of type B. And now we just have another list of promises without a single line of library code. If you do start writing extra library code, you can do more and more interesting stuff. But it kind of demonstrates to me that it's a slightly more useful abstraction. We don't get this leak straight away. We can start using it with some tools in our language. So sounds like I'm pretty excited about promises. But to me, we still haven't got back to simplicity. Um, we still have these alien things in our language that we have to unwrap. We can't just start using JavaScript, things like ifs and elses can't compose with promises because they are a wrapped thing. There's a real value inside that's going to be fulfilled at some point, but it's not ready right now. So we can't look inside it. We can't, for instance, if a promise fails, we can't use a try and catch. We've lost a lot of the kind of friendly, basic JavaScript stuff that we've always been you know, using and know and love. And I think uh, this might be the real hell of async, is that we've basically taken away a bunch of the normal stuff in JavaScript that we use every day. You know, the, half the language is kind of inaccessible for us to reason about these processes. We can reason about synchronous stuff, where we have the values. But if you were designing a language around async, it'd be kind of neat if a language composed with it. If we could use a for loop over like some processes, or we could use an if and else and a try and a catch. Um, is there anything we could do? Do we need to just give up and go back to something synchronous if we want this kind of simplicity? Are we just going to have to accept kind of Callbacks as the a cost of doing business in, in like an asynchronous world? Well, we, maybe we could do something like this. What if the language could put some kind of line where we just say, OK, wait for this, and then keep going? As soon as you've got this, then we can use it in the if straight away. So we kind of unwrap the asynchronousy. Is this a possible thing to do? It certainly exists in other languages. If you have a look at C Sharp, there's an await keyword that lets you do stuff with async. You can even see stuff that compiles to JavaScript, like Iced Coffee Script gives you the await keyword. It's kind of cool, but do we have to leave JS to get back to this kind of synchronous code? Synchronous looking code, anyway. No. Excitingly, we don't. There's some new stuff coming in JavaScript very soon, in ES6. Uh, you can also use it in Tracer, the compiler from ES6 to ES5, um, which gives us something really cool. It gives us a tool called generators. Now, generators aren't designed for this. It's not the only thing they do. Generators are extremely general. But one of the things they're really good at is cleaning up boilerplate. Boilerplate like the fact that we have these wrapped values we want to use with basic code. You know, unwrapping them the whole time is basically what we're doing when we use either callbacks or promises. We have to unwrap the asynchronousy, get back to synchronousy, do an if. Be really neat if we didn't have to. Generators are great for this. So a basic introduction to generators. So they're in the ES6 spec. They're, they're pretty much guaranteed to go into the next version of the language, um, which I think is supposed to be finalized in December, but it's kind of hard to know exactly when. Uh, it's usable in Tracer, it's usable in, in Node, I think, from like 0.11 onwards. 
if, with the Harmony flag. Uh, it's usable in Chrome Canary right now to have a play around with. Um, and they're a really neat little thing. So you define a generator with this little star next to the function that says, I'm a generator con constructor. It does, it's not a kind of generator, it kind of builds them. Um, and you call it, and you get back a generator that you can start using. So in this code over here, we have a wild true. You're never really that comfortable when you see a wild true in your code. It's obviously not going to be doing very particularly good things if that does execute. But in generator land, that's fine, because we have this kind of intermediate return called yield. So when we get our generator, you can see we've got the counter. We call count, we get our generator. We can start running the generator until the point it hits a yield, just by calling next. So the first time in this code, we call yield. We should get back, uh, we'll get back one. And then the next time we go, oh, actually zero, and then the next time we call it, we're gonna get back one. And the next time around the loop, we're gonna get back two. And we get this tuple back with a result and a done uh, key. So you can see that we can use this to build kind of infinite processes. So we can generate like all the prime numbers or something in, in a very simple code. Again, it's quite neat that we can break up the algorithm and the, how it runs with generators. It's kind of a neat little, little operation. So what can we do with these generators? Now we know how they work. Um, we can start writing code that looks a lot more like this. So this looks hopefully pretty synchronous. Is that kind of code readable to everyone? Is that readable? Nice. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a, a function called three queries, and we've wrapped our generator in some glue co code called a waitable. Now remember I was saying that generators aren't magically designed for this, but they're a tool we can use for this. So we have some glue code called a waitable that takes a generator and turns it into this magic thing that lets us do awaits. Um, and all we're doing over here is we have three processes. Now each of these return a promise. In this version we're using promises plus generators. I'll talk a bit about the options. So we've got three queries that are being kicked off. Now they're all kicked off asynchronously. We've got all those lines, they just return a promise. So we have a promise A, B and C. And what we want to do is we want to return a list of unwrapped values. And what we can use is this await. So we go over our promises, A, B, C. We can see we're also using the ES6 for of loop, just to cut down a bit of boilerplate. We're not having to use var i, blah, 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 blah. We're just saying for of. Uh, so we go over each of the promises, and we push in the result of that promise. We yield, which waits until the promise is done, and then come back straight away. So obviously promises, we don't care which order they're done. It doesn't really matter to us because as soon as they're done, we're just going to zip around the loop, um, and they'll all come back in. We get unwrapped values back into our results array, and that's returned. So we can start to write stuff with just loops. You know, it's pretty simple stuff. We've got these promises, and the unwrapping is almost invisible. We just use this yield keyword, exactly the same as await. In this implementation, we've effectively rebuilt await, but just with the generators in JavaScript. Cool, how, how does this work? Now this is the point, I may well get confused, but if I do, it's just a black box, you don't have to worry about it too much after you get that you need to use it with promises. Um, so this is q.async's implementation. So q is a promise library, uh, really nice one, it's worth having a go with. And what we do is we, we create our, we've got our make generator, so we pass in the kind of generator constructor as you saw, and then we set up some callbacks. And the basic idea is that we're gonna call the generator uh, we're going to get back a promise every time, and then we attach the next, as in to call the next loop of the generator to the promise's resolution, and we attach the throw to the promise's uh, failed, or the uh, reject. And you can see that that's just basically going to take us around the loop, going through each of those yields in turn until we're done. We run off the bottom of the generator, and when we run off the bottom of the generator, we return that value. So we've got loads and loads of asynchronous stuff inside the generator, but we end up with an unwrapped value that we can return to normal code. Pretty sweet. Um, so if we use this code, we can see that we can do our dependent processes, so the A and the B. Uh, you can see here we're, we're not doing them at once. They're dependent, so it's like a chain. So we can just get back to, if you want to do the first thing first and the second thing second, we can just do that. Looks completely the same asynchronous code plus the yield keyword. Uh, parallel stuff is really easy. We can just block on the two promises with a loop, and as soon as they're done, we're off the bottom of the generator. Again, we're just using basic JavaScript again. Nothing complicated. We've kind of taken Node from scary and different back to pretty simple uh, and using all the JavaScript we know and love. Uh, uh, enumerating, again, we just go back to four of loops, or maps, or whatever you like. There's nothing particularly complicated again. We're back to just normal JavaScript because of this unwrapping, which is pretty cool. 
Now, the thing to say is it still leaks the asynchronousy. There's no way in JavaScript of saying, this bit of my code is asynchronous, and I'm going to call it, and I'm going to get back a value synchronously. You still have to have your entire program async, which is kind of sounds like we, we haven't managed to get to the end. We haven't managed to completely build JavaScript around async. But actually, it's a really good thing. If you can do that, then you're going to get into the world of threading, because you're effectively going to have to block the whole thread, and then you might get preempted, and there's all of the kind of threading hell that people in threaded languages uh, get, which is probably far more unpleasant than the callback hell. Single-threaded stuff is really nice, it's really easy to reason about. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing that we can't kind of hide async in one portion of our program. It's good to be explicit about the async. So I think we've won. We've done a pretty good job. We've come from spaghetti code and, and kind of ad hoc solutions. We come from the library, which I think kind of leaks. The abstraction isn't quite there. We've solved the problem of time because we had the, you know, the callback having to line up everything ahead of time rather than just getting a value that you can use in lots and lots of places with promises. And then we can clean up our code. We can clean up that unwrapping thing um, with generators. We can remove that boilerplate. So it's all, it's all good. And we've, we've found that we still have to leak the async into the rest of our program, but I think everyone should be kind of happy about that. That's one of the joys of JavaScript is that we don't have threading. So in conclusion, um, we don't need to inline everything. In fact, you shouldn't inline everything. Do not inline everything. Get some named functions. Use bind. Get some test in there. It's all nice and simple. Uh, and JS has tools for the kind of stuff that Haskell fanboys will line up in like a blog post in a straw man. All of those can normally be solved with some pretty simple JavaScript stuff. Uh, ad hoc solutions like async, I think they leak. Promises do a pretty damn good job. But in the future with generators, I think we're going to get back in our application code to really nice, synchronous looking code. I think that's something to be excited about. I really can't wait. So uh, thanks a lot. That's me.